Welcome to Your Leo Nation. I'm the Chief, Mark Garrett. Hey, I want to come to you today with a, a special, kind of abbreviated show, kind of condensed. Um, I've been thinking lately about a phrase we hear often, and that phrase is the wrong side of history. You hear that a lot. We don't want to be on the wrong side of history. Do you want to be on the wrong side of history? Oh, that person's going to be on the wrong side of history. I'm not going to be on the wrong side of history. We hear it a lot. But you know what? The same people talk about that often are not the people who go back and read history. They think that they are divine in their understanding of of tomorrow, what's going to be the right side of history, that they will always be right. See, these are the same people who know beyond any doubt whatsoever. They know for sure that had they been alive in 1835 in Mississippi and they were rich white people, they know for 100% certainty that they would not have been slave owners because they would have been enlightened and they would have been brave, and they would have been self-sufficient, and they would have lived with equity and love for all, that they would not have been part of the evil slave owner society, that they would have rebelled, they would have fought politically or physically to end the institution. They know it for a fact. But these same people live today and watch the abuse of certain law enforcement agencies across this country and they look at the abuse perpetrated by politicians in this country, and they not only don't condemn it, they actually support it and champion it unabashedly. And they think that this support and these positions they hold are going to be on the right side of history tomorrow and next year and next century. And I actually say to you, they're wrong. They either don't read history or they read it and they ignore it and they dismiss it. So today I want to talk about just a few things, some contemporary, some not so contemporary that have happened in our society when it comes to the abuse, the bastardization of law by elected officials, by bureaucrats, by so-called leaders of law enforcement that have researched, that have actually demeaned the the profession of law enforcement. I'm not talking about the street cop. I'm talking about so-called leaders that have done things that have embarrassed and humiliated and undermined the the actual professionalism and the honor of law enforcement. And also, you know, I thought a long time during this podcast and, and about where this is coming from. And I've said it before, ladies and gentlemen, that as a, as a 60 year old man who grew up in Southeast Los Angeles during the 1960s and seventies, whose parents were lifelong Democrats. And I was a Democrat for half of my life, almost about half my life before I re- became a Republican. It's just time that we stop playing games about, where these abuses are coming from. I don't mean on every specific instance in law enforcement about the betrayal of an oath of office, not every single time, but I'm talking in general. And in life, if we want to be grownups, if we want to be mature, if we want to be intellectually honest, we always have to speak in generalities because we can always find exceptions to the rule. Absolutely. In one's personal life, in your professional life and society and politics, all of us, no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, if you're in the middle, we can always find exceptions. But life is determined by generalities when we talk about politics, when we talk about law enforcement, when we talk about rule of law, when we talk about culture. Life is determined by generalities. We have to be big enough to actually understand and appreciate those generalities. So with that said, I want to go back and just read a couple of things here historically. Again, some way back and some pretty contemporary. <clears throat> so as, as, as an example of 
the abuse of authority. We go back to the 1930s with FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was a four-term president, the last four-term president before the Constitution was amended. You know, he, he utilized the IRS to go after his political opponents. This is very well documented. And from that time on, federal agencies often became, um, quite frankly, contaminated with political intrigue and political influence and no longer being the objective law enforcement agencies that they were designed to be and were sworn to be by their rank and file and their leaders. You move forward to the 1950s and the 60s. FBI Director, and I'm actually reading from an article here, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover's Counterintelligence Project, codename uh, Cointelpro, had unlimited access to the IRS files such as suspected subversive, that's in quotes, subversive organizations as the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and the National Council of Churches, the NAACP, was a target of the FBI in the 1950s and 60s. The FBI was weaponized to go after a group they considered subversive then. Was the FBI on the wrong side of history back then? Is it on the wrong side of history now? I'll tell you right now, any agency that does its job, any law enforcement institution that does its job in any way based on political favor is on the wrong side of history. Any, any agency. And we know this happened. It even ordered an IRS audit of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In the early 1960s, the IRS responded to President John F. Kennedy's public complaints about tax-exempt conservative groups by setting up the uh, Ideological Organization's Audit Project, which challenged their tax status. But it was President Richard Nixon who most blatantly wielded the IRS as a political weapon. I tell you that for a reason. Richard Nixon was a paranoid. He also abused the IRS or abused his authority with the IRS. The point is, this goes uh, across political lines often. The point is, is that here's an institution that was corrupted because of political influence, definitely on the wrong side of history. It's so important to know this and realize that what we're seeing now whether you believe it's happening or not, I do believe it's happening. It's not the first time in history. I hope it's the last, what we're seeing right now, but let's don't hold our breath. We talk about political influence. Remember the couple in St. Louis back in 2021 during the riots? They were on their own property and a group of Protesters, I put that in quotes, because they had actually broken through a gate onto private property, were walking down this couple street, making audio verbal threats. And this couple came out onto their own property with firearms to defend themselves and their property. They were later charged by Kim Gardner, the circuit attorney in St. Louis, for felonies. She said it, it is illegal to weigh weapons in a threatening manner at those participating in a non-violent protest. Well, this woman's corrupt. We know she's corrupt because she failed to prosecute far more violent crimes during the same period in that city than these people who didn't fire a shot, who stood their ground on their property defending themselves because they were in fear of their own safety. And the charges were later dropped Maybe they were a pardon, I can't remember. But the point is, here's another example of a politician, elected official, a government entity, the DA's office or circuit attorney in this case, using their power to intimidate and to punish political opponents. 
We know this has happened. We know it's happening now. And it needs to stop. But this is recent history. It is history. This woman is on the wrong side of history. We know that these people who were defending themselves and their property had never hurt anybody or there was no reason to believe they were going to hurt anybody that day. But this was a show for Kim Gardner, this degenerate in St. Louis, who persecuted and tried to prosecute these people who had done nothing wrong. Going back a little further, talking about politics, I want to read something to you. And I want to give credit to Prager University, Dennis Prager's organization that just does amazing work. He has some of the most amazing people, by the way, from all political spectrums on on this website with this organization. But I want to give him full credit. These people talk about the rule of law. They talk about history. They talk about global warming. They talk about marriage. Any number of topics are talked about on this platform. So if you don't know uh, Prager University, please check it out. Sign up for it. I'm not getting anything for this. I'm not affiliated with Prager University. I've only met Dennis Prager once. He wouldn't know who I am. (laughs) But I learned from them, and I hope you will too. But let me read this to you because everything I talk about, like I've said before, is related to law enforcement, either in the specific interactions between a police officer and a violator, a citizen, or the macro that we're talking about now, and especially going back to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Everything that we enjoy in this country, as far as our freedom, comes from the Declaration of Independence and where the Declaration is codified, is is put into law in the United States Constitution. People talk about this right and that right and so forth and so on. You talk about rights in any number of other countries in this world and just guess what would happen to you. Go try to talk about your civil rights in China or North Korea or any number of other states, even uh, countries, even other countries that we'd be happy to visit um, that are relatively free. You do not have at least as this show is being recorded, I hope it doesn't get any worse than this, but you do not have the rights, the freedoms, the God-given rights that you have in this country. And all of these things are based on what's codified in the United States Constitution. And I implore you to listen to me about where the attack on the Constitution is coming from in this country today. Whether it's that street cop, whether it's a large federal law enforcement agency, whether it's a county sheriff's department, it doesn't matter. Everything eventually goes back to the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. And if we stop adhering to what our founding fathers put into these documents For us, we are going to lose our God-given freedoms. And that's where our freedoms come from. That's why it's in the Constitution. That's why it's articulated in the Declaration. That our rights come from God and nature's God. Period. They don't come from man. But guess what? They can be taken away from man. By man. I'm sorry. They can be taken from us by man. In other words, by humans, ladies. Don't want to offend anybody. Our rights are God-given. They are not man or human-given, but they can sure be taken away by humankind. So to that point, let me read this from Prager University, Carol Swain. Amazing lady. She's a prominent professor, and this will be very quick. When you think about racial equality and civil rights, which party comes to mind? The Republicans or the Democrats? Most people probably say the Democrats, but this answer is incorrect. 
Since its founding in 1829, the Democrat Party has fought against every major civil rights initiative and has long, a long history of discrimination. The Democrat Party defended slavery, started the Civil War, opposed Reconstruction, founded the Ku Klux Klan, imposed segregation, perpetrated lynchings, and fought against the Civil Rights Acts of 1950 and 1960s. In contrast, the Republican Party was founded in 1854 as an anti-slavery party. Its mission was to stop the spread of slavery into the new Western territories with the aim of abolishing it entirely. This effort, however, was dealt a major blow by the Supreme Court. In the 1857 case, Dred Scott versus Stanford, the court ruled that slaves aren't citizens, they're property. The seven justices who voted in favor of slavery, all Democrats. The two justices who dissented, both Republicans. The slavery question was, of course, ultimately resolved by a bloody civil war. The commander-in-chief during that war was the first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, the man who freed the slaves. Six days after the Confederate army surrendered, John Wilkes Booth, a Democrat, assassinated President Lincoln. Lincoln's vice president, a Democrat named Andrew Johnson, assumed the presidency. But Johnson adamantly opposed Lincoln's plan to integrate the newly freed slaves into the South's economic and social order. Johnson and the Democrat Party were unified in their opposition to the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, the 14th Amendment, which gave blacks black citizenship, and the 15th Amendment, which gave blacks the vote. All three passed only because of universal Republican support. During the era of Reconstruction, federal troops stationed in the South helped secure rights for the newly freed slaves. Hundreds of black men were elected to Southern state legislatures as Republicans, and 22 black Republicans served in the U.S. Congress by 1900. The Democrats did not elect a black man to Congress until 1935. But after Re Reconstruction ended, when the federal troops went home, Democrats roared back into power in the South. They quickly reestablished white supremacy across the region with measures like black codes, laws that restricted the ability of blacks to own property and run businesses. As they imposed poll taxes and literally uh, literacy tests used to subvert the black citizens' right to vote. And how was all of this enforced? By terror. Much of it instigated by the Ku Klux Klan, founded by a Democrat, Nathan Bedford Forrest. As historian er uh, Eric Fawner, himself a Democrat, notes, in effect, the Klan was the military force serving the interests of the Democrat Party. President Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, shared many views with the Klan. He resegregated many federal agencies and even screened the first movie ever played at the White House, the racist film, quote, The Birth of a Nation, unquote, originally titled The Klansman. A few decades later, the only serious congressional opposition to the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1964 came from, you guessed it, Democrats. 80% of Republicans in Congress supported the bill. Less than 70% of Democrats did. Democrat senators filibustered the bill for 75 days until Republicans mustered the few extra votes needed to break the logjam. And when all the efforts to enslave blacks keep them enslaved and then keep them from voting had failed, the Democrats came up with a new strategy. If black people are going to vote, they might as well vote for Democrats. As President Lyndon Johnson was purported to have said about the Civil Rights Act, I'll have them, in words, voting Democrat for the next 200 years. So now, the Democrat Party prospers on the votes of the very people it has spent much of its history opposing. Democrats falsely claim that the Republican Party is the villain when in reality, 
It's the failed policies of the Democrat Party that have kept blacks down. Massive government welfare has decimated the black family. Opposition to school choice has kept them trapped in failing schools. Politically correct policing has left black neighborhoods defenseless against violent crime. So when you think about racial equality and civil rights, which political party should come to mind? And it goes on to say, I'm Carol Swan, Swain, I'm sorry, professor of political science and law at Vanderbilt University for Prager University. Carol Swain's a great woman. I've listened to her a lot. And I hope you heard what I said. Some of the greatest attacks on civil rights in this country, the Constitution, have come from one party. And that party almost exclusively is responsible for the deterioration that we see in our cities, our big cities today, deterioration of law enforcement, of civil rights, of safe societies. It's coming from one side and not the, folk, uh, the other folks. It's all there is to it. I wish I could put it another way. Quite frankly, I wish it wasn't true. Again, I was a Democrat for a long time, but I had to look inward and I had to start reading and learning the facts. As a former law enforcement official and top manager for one of the largest agencies in this country, think about who you vote for when you're thinking about a safe community, a safe city, a safe county, a safe state, and a safe nation. Think about who you vote for. And by the way, I mean that specifically. Vote for the individual. Don't vote for the party. As you know, one of the biggest supporters that John McKinney, a lifelong Democrat who's running against George Cascone in the county of Los Angeles, is yours truly. I've had him on this podcast. He is a lifelong Democrat, but the man believes in the rule of law. When I talk about these policies, when I talk about these behaviors, I'm not talking about individual people. I'm talking about the preponderance, where things come from in mass. I support John McKinney because he's the kind of person I want running my county when it comes to law enforcement because he believes in the same tenets I do. So break away from the emotion. Take a hard look at who you vote for, really what you believe, what's important for you. Show some courage and do what I did. Yeah, I got yelled at from my mom back in the early 90s for breaking away from the Democrat Party. But I did it because I took a look at what I believed and I realigned myself with the party who's not by any means perfect, but the one that most, most supported what I believe in. So with that said, God bless all of you. Thanks for watching. Check us out on every platform you can think of because we're probably there. For Rumble, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, so forth and so on. Anthony, am I missing anything back there? I think I got it all. Guys, thank you. Stay safe. Take care of your families. God bless you. God bless America. Bye-bye.